for listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, podcasting to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on this first day of February 2013. Welcome to episode 256 of the Corbett Report podcast, Gladio Revisited. Now, I hope that most of the listeners in the audience will understand that Gladio, in today's uh, title, refers to Operation Gladio, a false flag terror operation that is commonly understood to be a NATO stay-behind operation that was formed in the wake of World War II as a bulwark against the possibility of Soviet invasion in Western Europe. But, uh, and it is certainly something that we have covered here on the podcast in the past. For example, most notably in episode 49 of the podcast back from July of 2008 in an episode entitled Paperclip Nazis and Stay Behind Gladios. And it is something we've covered elsewhere on the Corbett Report besides. And it is something that is being increasingly covered in the alternative media. And I think that references to Operation Gladio are... Uh, thankfully becoming more common because it is an exceptionally important piece of the entire war on terror paradigm history that uh, makes sense of much of that history and puts it into the proper context of the strategy of tension, which is the underlying philosophical ideological basis for false flag terrorism, why and how that uh, that entire idea operates. So it is vitally important that people come to an understanding of Operation Gladio and the admitted history of this operation. And it is heartening to see this being referenced more and more in the alternative media. But I fear that there is something of a dogma coming to surround what Operation Gladio was and its place in history, emphasis on history, instead of its understanding in its proper context and role as something that is still ongoing today and still forms the basis of the war on terror paradigm that we are currently living through. And it is my hope that today in on the podcast we will at least start exploring some of the ways in which Operation Gladio is ongoing and is still affecting the world around us. And we have to understand this vitally important history to have a proper grasp on what all of this war on terror is really all about. So in order to start dissecting the official alternative history of Operation Gladio, of course, once again, it is important to remember that Operation Gladio is now a completely officially admitted uh, operation and there's a lot of the history has been declassified and has been put out in various parliamentary reports, most notably, of course, in its original expose in the Italian parliament. But there is, as I say, a dogma forming around it, a, a nice short encapsulation of op Operation Gladio that I think, if not uh, totally uh, gets it wrong, at the very least, it does miss out very important key details about the operation and what's really behind it. So first, let's start by taking a look at that, that idea of Operation Gladio as it has been cemented in the minds of uh, the few who have actually bothered to look into it. And there is a couple of sources that have become standards. For example, one of the ones that we mentioned back in episode 49 was the now classic uh, BBC Two 1992 documentary Operation Gladio that was directed by Alan Frankovich, and that is widely available online. I will put a link once again in the show notes to that, as it is one of the essential documentaries, even as it was coming out just shortly after the exposure of Operation Gladio. It still is one of the baseline documentaries for an understanding, a wide overview understanding of what the operation was about. But if we are going for a wide overview, short, in a nutshell, encapsulation, popular understandings of an event, why not go to that source for all things? popular and usually misconceptions of events, Wikipedia, which has an entry on Operation Gladio, which gives the kind of short-form synopsis that I'm sure most of the listeners are familiar with by now. And in the Operation Gladio entry on the Wikipedia page, it reads, quote, Operation Gladio is the codename for a clandestine NATO stay-behind operation in Europe during the Cold War. Its purpose was to continue anti-communist actions in the event of a Soviet invasion and conquest. Although Gladio specifically refers to the Italian branch of the NATO stay-behind organizations, Operation Gladio is used as an informal name for all stay-behind organizations, sometimes called Super NATO. 
end quote. Well, that is the, the absolute short form encapsulation of what Operation Gladio was, and this is usually followed up with some of the incidents that uh, form some of the most spectacular uh, examples of what Operation Gladio did. For example, of course, the uh, the Bologna bombing and uh, the murder of Aldo Moro and uh, the Piazza Fonta- Fontana bombing, some of the other spectacular incidents that have been linked to Operation Gladio, and uh, lots of them in the Italian context specifically. That seems to have been the one that has been the most exposed and the most delved into. But it is important to note that this is something that took place in a number of different European countries, and as even Wikipedia goes on to note, it was not only in some of the uh, uh, European NATO-friendly uh, countries, but also in some neutral countries. So it, it did take place in a wide swath of Europe, and although it is most commonly now associated with NATO as a stay-behind operation, i.e. these are forces that were planted in various countries that would stay behind in the event of a Soviet takeover to act as a resistance. The reality, once we start to peel off the layers of that rhetoric, is that, in fact, it wasn't started by NATO. It uh, actually predated NATO. And, in fact, the idea that this is some sort of passive stay-behind operation that somehow got out of control or self-activated or however the, the dominant narrative puts it, that also is a misconstrual of the, the actual reality on the ground. And uh, to Wikipedia's credit, it at least notes later on in that synopsis, quote, the role of the Central Intelligence Agency in sponsoring Gladio and the extent of its activities during the Cold War era and its relationship to right wing terrorist attacks perpetrated in Italy during the years of lead, late 1960s to early 1980s, and other similar clandestine operations, is the subject of ongoing debate and investigation, but never proved. Switzerland and Belgium have had parliamentary inquiries into the matter. End quote. Well, as I say, to their credit, they at least raised the controversy there in the opening uh, paragraphs of the Operation Gladio article. So, once again, I would suggest people use if not the Wikipedia page, perhaps the BBC documentary, as starting points to get a broad overview of what Operation Gladio was, its scale and scope. And of course, you might want to go back and re-listen or listen for the first time to episode 49 of this podcast, where we did talk about some of this uh, history. But in order to establish really the roots of Operation Gladio and uh, some of the ways that it began to unfold, we're going to turn to a conversation that I conducted quite recently with Tom Secker of Investigation the terror. And for those of you who have not checked out Tom Secker or his work before, I would wholeheartedly suggest you do so. And uh, you might start with some of the conversations that we've had with Secker on this podcast in the past. Uh, Very enlightening conversations on a host of topics to do with the war on terror paradigm and predictive programming and many other uh, uh, points of pieces of this puzzle besides. But in our latest conversation, which took place just over a week ago, we talked about Operation Gladio and its roots and where it really came from. And this is a very wide-ranging conversation. It's almost one hour long, so I would suggest, I would really implore people to go and listen to the entire interview where we get into a lot of the specifics of what Operation Gladio actually did, what was done in its name, um, and a lot of the the pieces uh, of mystery and puzzle that still surround this operation. But uh, with Tom Secker, we started by delving into the roots of the program, how it was established, and who was really behind it. Well, I mean, it started during World War II. Um, World War II obviously was a, a massive conventional military war, but it, it was also a massive unconventional intelligence war. And in fact, that's largely, I think, perhaps because of my, my biases and interests, I think that's how it was really kind of won and lost in a lot of respects. Um, Gladio started out as simple stay-behind units, the idea being that when it was kind of inspired by when the Nazis uh, spread out from Germany and seized Poland, Czechoslovakia, France, Denmark, Norway, Holland, um, the armies in a lot of those countries decided that they weren't going to fight them, basically. They decided there was no point trying to directly confront the Nazi war machine. But what they did, and what other countries on their side of the conflict did, was leave in stay-behind units, secret military units, that could be activated once the the incoming, the invading army had had taken over. 
So that's kind of where the idea for a Stay Behind Army starts. And interestingly enough, uh, Ian Fleming's brother was in the Special Operations Executive and was involved in setting up the Stay Behind Armies during World War II. Anyway, towards the end of the war, when it became relatively clear that the Allies were going to win and that the Axis powers were going to lose, um, the intelligence apparatus that had been set up, particularly in Britain, but also in America, became convinced that the next great threat, the great post-war threat, was going to come from Russia. Um, and this is sort of before the Soviet Union even really was the Soviet Union as, as we conceive of it, I think. Um, but nonetheless, they thought um, that very much that the, the danger was that having exhausted so much uh, defeating fascism, defeating the Nazis, that uh, they would leave themselves open to a Soviet conquering, a Russian conquering of Western Europe. Um, so at the end of the war, when most of the troops, the winning troops, the Allied troops went home and got on with their lives or as much as they could, um, various units, both intelligence and military units, were left in almost every Western European nation at least over a dozen Western European nations in any case. And these were under the guidance of the Special Operations Executive, which is sort of the paramilitary arm of MI6, or became that, um, and the OSS, which became the CIA. So that's where the operation kind of begun. And it did, I think, begin quite genuinely. They genuinely, rightly or wrongly, conceived of a Russian threat. And these units were actually left there at least in the start, for the purpose of potentially defending against that uh, forthcoming invasion. But as you, as your tone indicates, that of course isn't where things left off, and it developed a kind of life of its own, it kind of developed into something different, and it took different forms in different countries. And as I understand it, Italy perhaps was the most advanced or most developed form of this stay-behind operation that kind of took on a life of its own in the ensuing decades. And I suppose that is because of a number of factors, not least due to the internal politics of each country. But let's talk about um, NATO and how it started to become involved with this, because as you say, this was in, uh, essentially an intelligence operation. And as I understand it, there was something to do with NATO protocols. And as uh, countries signed on to NATO, basically part of what they were signing on to was basically uh, a tacit understanding that they wouldn't tackle right-wing extremists uh, that committing certain, you know, attacks and, 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 and spectacular events. To what extent do we have that formalized? To what extent do we know about those types of protocols? And to what extent was NATO really involved in, in furthering Operation Gladio? Well, I think NATO was centrally involved in turning Gladio from its original form of these essentially defensive stay-behind armies into something more proactive. Um, I mean, the exact documentation on NATO's, as you say, sort of uh, obligation, its protocols to member states as to what, I suppose, the political formulation of those countries would look like, and in particular, what the politics of their security services would be. Um, I'm sure it is very well documented somewhere, but it's not the easiest thing to get your hands on NATO paperwork. Um, in fact, it's almost impossible. NATO have refused, to my knowledge, every freedom of information request on this topic. Um, but there are testimony from NATO officials and from other people involved in these circles around this time, diplomatic circles and so on, who are saying that this is, in effect, what the deal was. But as as is so often the case with these things, the extent to which it was formalized, fair question, but it's kind of maybe beside the point. The point is, were those nations obliged to go along with this or not, regardless of whether it was on paper or whether it was just sort of, you know, said in the wind. Um, so I think NATO was integrally involved, in fact, in changing Gladio from its original form into its eventual form, because NATO is essentially the the Anglo-American establishment. That's all it ever really was, or it, it's a kind of outgrowth of that. Most of the member states of NATO don't really have a say in anything that it does. They just kind of have to go along with it. Um, 
And in particular, if you look at, uh, for example, the, the National Security Council's documents in the immediate post-war period, in the mid-late 40s, they explicitly talk about how, for example, the CIA was the designated agency for dealing with internal insurrections, as they saw it, i.e. political problems in other countries. Um, exactly what the connection between CIA and NATO is, to be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, it's not something I have a massive amount of information on. There must be quite a lot of connections. But um, I read Daniela Gantz's book on this, and I recent, recently read Richard Cottrell's book on this, um, and they only really managed to establish a kind of Department of Defense NATO connection. The CIA NATO connection is pretty much shrouded in secrecy. So, you know, exactly where the lines of authority are being drawn in this is, is not at all clear. Um, what happened is relatively clear. Exactly who was responsible is a, a bit more kind of fuzzy. But but as you say, I think it it, it probably is a little bit of a, um, a formality to establish the paperwork of it. And in some ways, I think this goes to show that there is, in fact, uh, some sort of governing principle, governing bodies, governing people behind the scenes that are not necessarily uh, established through paperwork that's documented, but are demonstrably still behind these types of operations, perhaps um, most notably in this particular instance with the French withdrawal from NATO, which of course did not affect in any way the stay behind operation that was in France. There were still the stay behind units there. So so I think we can see that there is a, a kind of a disconnect between whatever formal agreements might have been uh, functioning and what uh, what individual countries might have been actually doing on the ground. And I think another example of that is the fact that many of the leaders of these countries did not necessarily know about the stay behind operations in those countries. Perhaps you can speak to the kind of disconnect between the actual reality and who knew what about what was actually happening in their own countries. Well, I mean, there is a, a useful example in uh, the, the Portuguese Gladio in that uh, it wasn't quite as kind of formally involved with the local intelligence services as it was in other countries, in particular in Italy. In Italy you're talking about military intelligence people setting up, actually creating from the ground up, right-wing extremist militant groups like Ordine Nuovo, Avangardia Nazionale. Uh, these were invented by people like Pino Rauti who worked for the Italian military intelligence. That's kind of unambiguous. Um, in Portugal, it was a bit different. I, I'm, I'm not convinced that there's any evidence that I've seen that the local Portuguese intelligence actually knew what was going on. Um, it was largely run through an organization called the Agenta Press, who, uh, as, as, as the name suggests, it, they were a kind of radical publishing press, a radical right-wing publishing house. Um, but that in itself was a front for a bunch of people who have all kinds of OSS connections or kind of neo-Nazi connections and what have you. Uh, one guy in particular, the guy who, who set up the Agenda Press, was a guy called Yves Gerin Serac. He is ex-Vichy military intelligence from World War II. He's a, a Nazi collaborator. Um, so he sets up this organization and it is used for not just kind of uh, propagating right-wing ideology or white, extreme right-wing ideology, but also for uh, kind of transshipment of the various things that you would need to run a secret army. So we are talking explosives and guns, but we are also talking people. Um, the Agenda Press in particular was involved with shipping people over to Latin America so they could be trained in the School of the Americas. It links up to that extent. Um, and obviously some of these people then end up in coups like the one in uh, uh, Chile. Um, so it's, it's sort of, it's obviously connected directly to British and American military and British and American intelligence. But I don't think I've never come across, for example, a local Portuguese intelligence agent who was working at a high level in the Agenda Press. I've never found any kind of connection like that in, in, in my reading on the topic. So all of this suggests very much that this is sort of uh, not just an outgrowth of the Stay Behind Armies from World War II, but I suppose also an outgrowth from uh, Project Paperclip and the 
kind of Western Nazi collaboration post-war, um, because a lot of these people then seem to kind of turn up in the early sort of 1940s, 1950s Gladio gangs. Once again, Tom Secker of Investigating the Terror, and once again, I ask you to go and listen to the entire interview so that you can get the bigger overview of Operation Gladio and the way that it unfolded in Western Europe and some of the questions that still surround the operation. Once again, Tom Secker, just an absolute fount of information on all sorts of topics like this, and he has definitely done his homework on Operation Gladio as well, so it is a very interesting conversation. But from that point, I want to transition into, I think, something that is uh, oft neglected, if not completely uh, unknown to a lot of even the most diligent alternative media researchers, and that is the effects of Operation Gladio not in Western Europe, as most of the, the focus of the scholarship on Operation Gladio hitherto has focused on, but its effects in Central Asia and the Caucasus region up until the present day. And this is just an absolutely fascinating piece of the Operation Gladio puzzle that puts into perspective the entire war on terror paradigm as it exists today, not 30 years ago in the context of bombings that took place in Italy or, or anything of that sort. That is vitally important for people to understand and expose as documented examples of false flag terrorism that we can now identify as having come and sourced from NATO and Western intelligence agencies and, uh, and their, their minions in various positions. But it is important to understand how this is affecting us today. And there are lots of glimpses into this that we've seen in the last several years for those who have been paying attention. So I'm going to put some of those links and sources in today's uh, uh, documentation section, along with, of course, all the other articles, interviews, and videos that I mentioned today, but uh, with some provisos and caveats. Um, just like Wikipedia or any other source like that, there are good pieces of information to be taken away, but of course there is also misleading pieces of information and some information is omitted altogether that makes the entire picture uh, altogether different than what it really is. So, for example, I'll point people to an interesting article by Christopher DeLiso from Antiwar.com from February 2008 called Deep State Coup Averted in Turkey, which does have a good overview of some of the ways that the Cold War and NATO and the Deep State came together through Operation Gladio to affect what was happening in Turkey and the creation of the Deep State there and some of the ultra-nationalist uh, factions that were energized through the auspices of this operation. But as, uh, as Sibel Edmonds pointed out to me, for example, recently when we were preparing for our own interview on this subject, although he does get some of the background to this story correct, he uh, misses out entirely on the current picture and gets some of the things just frankly wrong when it comes to the present day and age. So it does have some good background, but it can't exactly be trusted on all counts. I'm going to throw in another uh, link to something that is related and and deeply important when we come to the Turkish deep state and how that relates to this bigger picture. And that's an article by Gareth Jenkins from last year talking about the uh, sledgehammer and the politics of Turkish justice and, and so, some of the events that are happening right now in Turkey. Once again, an interesting source with lots of information um, and some very thorough notes on the situation. But Today, we're really going to get into this with an extended uh, feature interview with Sibel Edmonds. The audio of this interview has been posted in its entirety to CorbettReport.com. And although I say this quite often on the podcast, I could not stress this more vehemently this time. If you never take my advice on anything else ever again, please just go and listen to the full audio of this interview. It is probably the single most important interview I have ever conducted at the Corbett Report. It is full of very important information on exactly this topic, Operation Gladio, how it extended into Central Asia and the Caucasus, and how it is still continuing to operate there today through a new version of the same Operation Gladio, a new, a new form, a new plan B that has emerged from the Operation Gladio that is still still uh, very deeply entwined with world politics and, uh, and puts the entire war on terror into perspective. Again, I can't stress this enough. This has been covered in bits and pieces time and time again by Sibel Edmonds 
on BoilingFrogsPost.com. So I will throw in the links to some of the articles that she's uh, put up over the years uh, on this subject, including uh, the New York Times expose of Imam Gulen's charter schools and uh, also an earlier article um, talking about Washington Post's coverage of the uh, Fatullah Gulen Islamic network and its CIA ties. But Again, all of these bits and pieces are very difficult to put into the bigger picture when we uh, are unfamiliar with a lot of this information and its context. So in our interview, Sibel Edmonds did a brilliant job of outlining this context and putting it into, into place so that we can see how it developed. And unfortunately, there's no easy way to really excise just uh, significant chunks from this interview. The only way to do it is to play this interview in its full context. So I'm not going to play the entire interview, which is an hour long, but we are going to play a significant chunk of that interview on today's podcast. Once again, strap yourself in, get your notebooks ready, because there is a ton of information in this interview. And please, please help me to spread this information around to other people to get them informed about what Operation Gladio is still today really all about. So without further ado, I present to you my recent interview with Sibel Edmonds of BoilingFrogsPost.com. Sure. Um, Turkey always was the most important center country in all these Gladio operations before the fall of the Soviet Union. It's interesting because when I go and read uh, what's available, you know, to public online, which is very, very little on Gladio. That's why I was ecstatic when you had your interview on, on Gladio uh, a week ago. And, and what you see is usually these, like, Italy, you know, it's like Gladio and Italy and how it's unfolded, how it was disbanded, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't see much on Turkey, and Turkey was the most important, the most important Operation Center for Gladio, and obviously, you know, it, 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 it's because of A, its geographic location. Just take a look at Turkey on the map, and if you're looking for, you know, that period of time before the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, from Black Sea to its Eastern, you're looking at all the former Soviet blocs being there, and then again, its position within the, you know, uh, Middle East, and the other side being connected to Europe. So Turkey always had the most position within this Gladio operations until, you know, before the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and that you don't see. There are very few articles written out there, scattered. There's one good one by Le Monde, which was concentrating mainly on the, uh, the actors you just mentioned, Abdullah Chatle and Susurluk incident. And you have a couple of authors in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Switzerland and in uh, England who have written about this. Nothing, nothing here in the United States on that. So I give you a little bit of uh, history because you covered a lot of this with, uh, with your previous guests. But this history is going to concentrate more on the characters that we're going to be talking about and the Turkish side uh, on, on this Gladio operations until um, the fall of the Soviet Union. And in Turkey, there were two prime groups that were uh, working within Gladio network and carrying out some of the most important operations in uh, Western Europe, in Northern Europe, and, and mainly in uh, Eastern Bloc. And that was one, the formal official Turkish military. And that is made of both Turkish military and the Turkish military intelligence, directly connected to NATO, Russell, and within the Gladio operations. But then beneath the military, Turkish official military, you had the paramilitary force. Who were these people? And that's very, very interesting. These people, you know, again, you look at some of the articles and people talking about it. Yeah, they're saying they are ultra-nationalists. But what kind of jobs did they have? Who were these people who were recruited by Turkish military, trained and absorbed into NATO's, U.S. NATO's Gladio operations? Well, a lot of these people actually in 1980s, they were in jail, okay? They had uh, positions that were the best way to describe them would be the godfathers. 
in Turkey. Babas, that's how they refer to them in Turkey, the Babas, and which means the godfathers. They were the top people who ran, you know, blackmail, uh, heroin operations, and even back then, it was, Turkey has always been the most important artery in moving heroin into Europe, uh, whether it came through the borders through Iran, or it came via some Kurdish factions coming through Iraq. So Turkey has always been important. And these Babas ran, a military did too, Turkish military did too. But they were also ultra-nationalists, but they were secularist ultra-nationalists. They, they put Ataturk, the, the father of Turkey, the father of modern Turkey, and basically in the place of God, you know, and, and of course, Ataturk advocated secularism, forced secularism, and I have to emphasize this, forced secularism. And, and these guys, even when I was growing up in Turkey, they were very easy to identify. You know, they, they usually wore this mustache that really resembled uh, the Hitler mustache, and they had salutes that were like for gray wolves that was like this and uh, and their babas were in jail and these guys had informants all over not only in turkey but in elsewhere so as part of gladio's plan turkish military turkish police turkish intelligence forces they took all these notorious i mean these are psychopaths sociopaths okay these people are mass murderers they took them out of these prisons and they said, you know what, now you are going to, with your skills, with what you do, with what you know, you're going to serve the state. And that is Turkey. And the great Turkishness. And great Turkishness is also being protected by the West because the communists is out there. They're going to take us over. Then we have these issues with the Kurdish people. And meanwhile, you can also fill out your own pockets. You know, you can still be big. You can still be godfather. But... Your main role, and this is why we are releasing you, bringing you out, is going to be uh, serving us for all these operations. So these guys were removed. They were sent to various centers, including in Brussels, and they received training both via Turkish military, via U.S. Uh, NATO forces, and they were given diplomatic passports, not only Turkish uh, passports, but passports from various countries and they they still uh, moved you know worked in the area where you move you know heroin but uh, also weapon smuggling uh, mass murders a lot of false flag attacks not only inside Turkey but in other countries as well and again your guests talked about some of these the assassination camps of Pope etc etc and uh, and they also filled out their own pockets so these were the characters. Now, it's very interesting, you say, for a lot of people would say, well, you know, this was before, you know, during communism, and we also did things with Mujahideen and bin Laden in Afghanistan, and also it deals a lot with Turkish politics. So why should that interest people here in the United States? And, and because this is as much as they know or they read or they hear. So what happens after the fall of the Soviet Union? Well, the character you just mentioned, Abdullah Çatlı, he's one of the main foot soldiers, one of the main commandos under the military, which is Turkish military, which is under NATO and the United States, one of the most notorious figures. I mean, this guy was responsible in and outside Turkey of tens of thousands of murders, bombs. Uh, in some cases, they would just uh, storm a house with medical students in Turkey and they would cut everybody's heads. And, you know, those people were accused of um, advocating for socialism or communism. Uh, this guy it actually ends up on the list of most wanted for, you know, Interpol's most wanted list. Okay. And for various reasons, murders, international murders, not only murders in Turkey. You're looking at Interpol's most wanted, right? Uh, heroin smuggling, weapon smuggling. So he's on the top 10 most wanted people. And, uh, and this is at post-Soviet Union. And, uh, and he ends up in a jail in a high-security prison in Switzerland. He gets arrested during one of his movement's operations. And... 
When you look at some of the reporting on this guy, including the newspapers, you know, or the articles written on, on the Grey Wolves, it says, while he was in this high security prison in Switzerland, this is Abdullah Chatle, he escaped. He actually escaped by, uh, by a support of helicopter. So you're in a high security prison in Switzerland and you mysteriously escape via helicopter and some more detailed stories from very few reporters who followed up and wrote on this. And that was a NATO owned helicopter. I mean, this really sounds like a movie plus, something that Hollywood would make. And so, yeah, this is the most wanted Interpol guy. It gets even a stranger. Same guy, while still wanted after he escapes NATO helicopter from high security Swiss prison, he mysteriously ends up in England, in London. Okay? And again, mysteriously, in 1989, the government, UK government, grants him citizenship. Ha! Huh. It's not even one year since he enters UK. He's still the most wanted on Interpol's list. And then, within a year after that, the same guy, Abdullah Chatle, flies over, comes to the United States, and this is around 1990, 1991, comes to Chicago, and is mysteriously given an American passport. In American uh, uh, green card. This is not passport yet. And during all this time, he is among the top 10 most wanted people by the Interpol. Okay? Now, the first question people should ask, especially those who say, oh, this is about some, you know, during Cold War and communism and it's a Turkish internal politics. Why the most wanted guy by Interpol, notorious murderer, drug runner, ends up in England, of all the places, and gets a citizenship. Why he comes to the United States and is given another citizenship? So that's the first questions listeners should be asking. And why Chicago is where he settles. And that's where he settles. And when he settles there, he has dozens of entry and exit from Chicago. And after the Susurluk scandal, which I'm going to uh, get into it, it basically comes out, you know, with all the investigations they had in Turkey that from Chicago, he carried out all these operations in Central Asia, Caucasus, Eastern Europe, uh, Xinjiang province of China. So he kept flying. So he's still most wanted by Interpol. Okay, we don't know how and why he got all the citizenships, why he's most wanted and why he carried four or five diplomatic passports. Nobody gets into those questions. And these diplomatic passports are not only given to him by government of Turkey. So he one of his trips, again, this is very well documented. This is not conspiracy theory. This is not some top secret classified documents any longer because these stuff all came out during this after this scandal in Turkey. So he, in 1996, 1995, he is the one who goes to Azerbaijan from Chicago, via Turkey, goes to Azerbaijan with a theme of several people, less than a dozen. He carries out the, this attempted assassination uh, against uh, Aliyev. This is the Aliyev senior before his son became, you know, the the president of um, of Azerbaijan. And, I, and it was meant to be an attempted that would not succeed. So, it, because if you look at Azerbaijan's position during that same time, 1994 to 1996, before this assassination attempt, you would see that Aliyev was still siding with Russia. It was still the old royalties, you know, the, the, the old loyalties of we were part of, you know, the Soviet Union and we are still siding with Russia. Now, this is when United States, the West, was trying via its proxy, Turkey. Why Turkey? They speak Turkish. What language do they speak in these countries, including Azerbaijan? Turkish. They are Muslim. What's the religion in Azerbaijan and all these ex-Soviet blocs? Muslims. So this was the ideal proxy to go grab countries like Tajikistan and, and, and Kyrgyzstan and, and Azerbaijan and say, okay, say bye-bye to Russia. We want you to be one of us, right? 
Well, of course, Russia was doing its part from the other side. So during this period when this assassination attempt occurred, Aliyev Sr., the president in Azerbaijan, still was loyal to Russia. And all these different attempts to move him to the other side had not been successful. So they moved to plans that included assassination attempt, paired up with blackmails. Because again, during this time, the doors, the borders were open in Azerbaijan. A lot of these Turkish babas, godfathers, moved in there and they opened really lavish, interesting casinos. You can say casinos, Azerbaijan, yeah. And guess what? Several Aliyev's families were given advance uh, offerings in these casinos, and they collected a lot of debts, okay? And this is people very close to Aliyev Sr. And they started getting death threats, saying, well, if you don't pay off these millions and million dollars of debt in your casino gambling debt, we're going to take you out. Then comes the assassination attempt. So, again, if people were to go and look at the records on this assassination attempt on on Aliyev, they would see Abdullah Chatla's name. They would see that Aliyev came out and said the people responsible for this were NATO U.S. via Turkey. And the Turkish president calling and saying, no, these were the thugs, the mafia people, you know, they have nothing to do with us. All these denials. Whatever happened is... Aliyev very quickly switched position after this assassination attempt, okay? You fast forward, look at Azerbaijan. Since 1996, Azerbaijan been the closest ally of United States and NATO. In fact, they are becoming a NATO member. For the last eight years, NATO has been there with the base, training them. They've been passing the tests. They went from purchasing something like $25 million weapons from, uh, worth of weapons from the United States today to something like four, three and a half, four billions of, you know, four billion dollars of, of U.S. weapons. So success, Gladio was successful. It was who carried out Abdullah Chatla. After he finished, he just shook his hand and said, okay, mission accomplished, came back again to Chicago. Now I'm going to open a parenthesis here and say, Remember, for the past 11, 12 years, I've been talking about the center of all these operations that has to do with my state secrets privilege and people involved was in Chicago. I have been saying Chicago so many times, so I don't believe anyone is, at least not your listeners or mine, who haven't heard this, me saying Chicago, Chicago. So he went back to Chicago. This was one of his trips. His other trips included going from the other side, from through the Pacific, going to China, and then from there going to this area, Xinjiang. This is extremely important. Again, Xinjiang, Muslim population, and they are referred to, in Turkey, they don't call them Xinjiang. It's Turkistan, you know, Turkistan. They, they, they speak Turkey dialect. Guess what? Up there, a great place. Imagine, they get their independence. We can have our little mini base there. You know how close we are to China? I mean, okay, on one hand, you would say, yeah, there is, you know, Hong Kong. There's Taiwan out there. Well, this is going to be even more important than Taiwan. And then look again, the other important strategic location for Xinjiang, for Turkestan, a.k.a. Uyghuristan. You look at there, you see Pakistan, you see Afghanistan. This is a very important region. This has been a very important region price for the United States, for the West. We've been, we've been doing a lot of things there. Every time you hear, at least when I was working there during this period that FBI was investigating these, not operations there, but people here, the criminals in the U.S., who carried out the operations there. Those terrorist attacks, they were orchestrated from a long distance, okay? You go to Turkey, then from Turkey you go to Brussels, to England, uh, and then you go to the United States. So all the orchestration, it's not some minorities or some Muslims get together, suddenly they go and it's, it doesn't happen. It didn't happen that way, at least during that period. And this guy from Chicago was sent to go and organize, carry out a couple of terrorism uprising events, turn around, back to Chicago again, back to Chicago again. So NATO, the Gladio operation via Turkish military and Turkish godfather, ultra-nationalist criminal thug, 
uh, paramilitary continued until around 1996. Towards the you know, period like 1994 to 1996, the decision makers, the top layers of NATO, the U.S., you know, what we usually refer to as shadow government, their powers, they were having this debate. They were having this two options in front of them, two plans. Which one is better? One is what they did before the fall of the Soviet Union, and that was using ultranationalism, fascism, okay, against the Soviet Union against communism versus what they have already seen as a very uh, successful, successful plan. One, they saw it in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen's bin Laden group. But then recently, and this is 1994, 1995, 1996, they were seeing its use again and again in Balkan, in the Balkans, in the Kosovo region, in, in Bosnia. And this is when we have all this Mujahideen, Bin Laden, Zawahiri, think about, you know, factions from Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, bringing them to Turkey, train them, bring them over there. It was like, you know, these ultranationalists, they haven't been very productive. And, and we think the Mujahideen Islamist factions are going to be much more useful in our main objective of taking over, having more of this ex-Soviet blocs on our side, okay, on our side. So this is during this, sometimes we use them, sometimes we use the, you know, the fascist, godfather, uh, ultranationalist. But then in 19, end of 1996, Abdullah Çatlı, the man we've been talking about, the tug, who went through Xinjiang and also, he comes to Turkey for another mission, that he was going to go and, and implement. However, while he's in Turkey, together with some beauty queen and a, and a few other colleagues, they are in Turkey, they're traveling in this black Mercedes, and they have a car crash, and they die. Everyone in the car except one guy dies, right? Well, before the Turkish police or military got to the bodies, the, the, the local police, the wouldn't know anything about who are these people. And the local journalists got to the scene. And lo and behold, here is the world's most wanted man, Abdullah Çatlı, the great grand, great uh, godfather, with all his diplomatic passports with him. But not only that, together with him, you have the chief of police of Turkey. I mean, the top police guy. You have incredibly important, legit political figures it was like WTF moment. What are they doing in the car with this guy? He died. Basically, this was when in Turkey, even though it had been leaked in little bits and pieces, it was this huge exposure of the thugs, criminal, you know, ultranationalist fascists actually working with and for the Turkish government. And for right now, I'm going to keep it Turkish government. That is the Turkish military, the Turkish, the legit Turkish institutions, right? So all the drug runnings they were doing, they were all controlled and managed by the state. And all the killings, the terrorisms that they were found responsible for, again, they were ex executed for the state, okay? This was huge in Turkey. It caused an uproar, a lot of documents started leaking, just like 9-11 commission. There was this huge commission established in Turkey Nobody talk about anything else but the Susurluk. They called it Susurluk scandal because the car accident took place in Susurluk. Now, there was this fear by the West, and this is the United States, you know, the Europeans like, uh-oh. Now, we know that a lot of these commission members, they are like ours, Thomas Kuhn, and but some of them, or by default, a lot of other, excuse my language, crap may come out about our roles, the stuff we did, we being the ultimate bosses. And guess what happened? One of the Turkish Gladio handlers in Turkey was the ambassador, United States ambassador in Turkey at the time, okay? This guy was the ambassador from 1992 until the Susurluk scandal. No other guy than Mark Grossman, 
the guy I have been saying for the past five, you got to look at Mark Grossman. So with this fear that um, a lot of secrets, state secrets were going to get out during this investigations and journalists digging in, some people were leaking, some people were talking, the United States right away got their man out of Turkey, Mark Grossman. No reason cited. He still had another one and a half, two years left. No reason cited. Guess who else was pulled? Another guy who was handling the Operation Gladio, the Turkish militant, in Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. This man, his name at the time, a major, Major Douglas Dickerson. This is the man, if you have read my book, if you know my case, was the one who was married to this spy in the FBI. Major Douglas Dickerson, he still had one and a half years left. He was working for Mark Grossman in Ankara. His main task under NATO was Operation Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. There were three or four countries that he directed the Turkish paramilitary Gladio operations in those countries. Lo and behold, the same man, this is documented. He is pulled off of his position and immediately sent to a base in Germany. This is American military base, and from there to Brussels. Ha! Huh, this is interesting. Now, these characters that have been talked about in my case for 12 years were there in 1997, so sort of look happens, they were pulled out. So was the top military man, and this was uh, the top man for the Turkish so-called counterterrorism operations commando, was sent on a mission to uh, Washington, D.C., Turkish embassy. And again, this is documented. Right after Sustuluk, they had to get him out. He was a chief guy in the military overseeing these thugs and these operations, these false terror, false flag operations. Not only in Turkey, Central Asia, Caucasus, you know, a lot of Chechen operations, um, Eastern Europe. So he was pulled. He was sent to Washington, D.C. He never went back. Again, nobody cited any reason. They took all these important figures. They took them to Brussels, Brussels, and they took them to Washington, D.C. And then it was the decision-making time for the top guys in the world, okay, for, for NATO, U.S., U.K., saying too much exposure. This chapter is closed. Gladio is not closed. We are going to plan B. Gladio Plan B operations, which we have already prepared for it some to some extent, and that is we are not going to use paramilitary. We're going to use Islamist factions, who, a.k.a. Mujahideens, a.k.a. Al-Qaeda. Once again, the incomparable Sibel Edmonds, famed FBI whistleblower, host and founder of BoilingFrogsPost.com, in an extended interview on The Corbett Report earlier this week. So once again, I will urge you to go and get the entire audio of that interview available now for download from CorbettReport.com and please help spread this information around to others who are, even those who are awake to the false flag war on terror paradigm, because this puts into place a lot of the pieces that make this entire story make a lot more sense. And uh, hopefully, even for those who are not awake to this at all, they will be able to understand the pieces of this puzzle that are being laid out here. Now, if a lot of this information was new to you, and a lot of these names and dates and places are confusing and bewildering, well, take that as a good sign. It's a sign that we are encountering new information, and Information that has not been rehashed a thousand times over and that does add to the picture that is being painted here of the false flag war on terror and what it is really all about and who are some of the main players in this. Again, some extremely exceptionally important information. And if this leaves you with more questions than answers, I would say that at the very least, that's a sign that we are getting closer towards establishing what it is we are actually looking for in defining this war on terror. Now, of course, there are still many, many more questions to ask about this, the deep state in Turkey and how that plays into the entire Operation Gladio, how these actors have coordinated and collaborated in the past, what things are going on today that we can identify that are related to this uh, this deep state and the, the actions that are taking place behind the scenes, and what is likely to play out from here. A ton of information to think about, to ponder, to ask questions about, to try to connect some of these puzzle pieces together. 
But, of course, we can't do all of that in one podcast episode. So, for those of you who have listened to the whole Sibel Edmonds interview, you will notice that we are going to conduct further interviews on this topic in the future. We're going to continue delving into this, and including some of the names and dates and actors and, and people that we identified in that interview, and we're going to continue delving that into that in future interviews. And one thing that I have asked is for people to send in their questions for Sibel so that they can actually start to... Uh, to identify some of the things that they're still confused about or that they want outlined in greater detail or some of the people and places that they want explicated further. And if you send those uh, questions in through the contact form on CorbettReport.com, I will collate them and try to uh, distill them down to the essence and ask them to uh, Sibel in our next interview or interviews, perhaps, on this very important subject. So you are part of this conversation and we are going to delve into this together further from here. But let's use at least the information we have in today's episode and the information from the show notes for today's episode as the starting point for what is an, probably the most essential part of this entire war on terror uh, paradigm and narrative that's been created around us and getting to the bottom of what is really behind it. So we're going to leave the investigation there today. And again, we've looked at so much information that I hope uh, you will use this and, and reuse this episode as, uh, as a guide along your quest for finding out more information about who these people are and the way they fit together. And once again, please send in your questions for Sibel to the contact form of CorbettReport.com and we will continue delving into this in the future. And on that note, once again, let me remind you, Corbett Report is listener-supported media, so I do appreciate and genuinely thank all of the listeners out there who have supported either monetarily through subscribing or buying a DVD or for those who help to spread the word about this information. Once again, I couldn't do it without all of you. So on that note, we're going to leave it there for now, but I will be back in the very near future. So until then, thank you all for listening and take care. Rage, blazes, cage, mazes, spiral, jettison, viral, medicine, absent, heroin, labyrinth, narrow, and evil report. In portals found, time grows short. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.